in the book, I described three kinds of thinking, and there's scientific evidence for this. There's object visualizers like me, who think in pictures, terrible at algebra, but good at mechanical devices, animals, art, and photography. I have talked to many, many photographers that were dyslexic, they were a student with problem in school. Then you've got your visual spatial pattern thinkers, your mathematicians. They think in patterns, not pictures. Music and math go together. And then of course, you've got your verbal thinkers who think in words, and you've got people that are mixtures of the different kinds of thinkers. But I'm very concerned that the object visualizers or people like me are gonna get screened out and you need us. Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. There is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that no one knows enough about yet. It is so well hidden by all the negative noise in our media world that we're calling this wave a conspiracy of goodness. Yes, it is still an amazing world out there, and we will be sharing the stories and interviews and work of people who are making it that way. Hello, I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, founder of The Goodness Exchange. The Goodness Exchange is the mothership website of this podcast, and there you can have instant access to newsworthy insight and innovation that is just not rising to the top of our newsfeed. There you can find a more balanced perspective about the world out there which is filled with the most amazing people. And we are talking to them here and writing about them all the time on the Goodness Exchange. Today, we're here to shine a light on what's right with the world with an amazing author, scientist, educator, consultant um, named Temple Grandin. Dr. Temple Grandin was named one of the top 10 college professors in the US in 2020. And that's for an amazing reason. She has spent the last five decades demonstrating through her own work and teaching others that every brain is beautiful. She is perhaps the longest celebrated, most impactful autistic person in the world. For 50 years, she's been opening people's eyes with her groundbreaking insights about both livestock handling and animal welfare. And today, half the cattle in the United States, or maybe more, are handled in facilities she has designed because of her understanding and then communicating to us how animals think. And that has led to her being um, written about in Time Magazine, The New York Times, Discover Magazine, uh, Forbes, USA Today, it goes on and on. She's had, I, I can recommend this so wonderfully. She's had an HBO documentary um, that won an Emmy Award uh, written about her, simply called Temple Grandin. And in that documentary, it's, the, it's, it's a really engaging portrait of a, of a stigmatized, misunderstood young girl um, who learned to channel her unique gifts into a brilliant career as a scientist, author, and groundbreaking animal um, advocate. So Temple uh, Grandin, with all these awards, um, what she's really interested in these days, along with her consulting career, is helping us understand the potential in minds of all kinds. And um, she has an amazing story, which I hope she'll share with us. Temple Grandin, welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. Great to be here. Well, I want to tell everyone um, that this morning um, I, uh, I was running around my household sharing Temple's new book called Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. I can't tell you how many people I texted and emailed about this book this morning, and I shared it with everyone in my household because it describes the way my second daughter, our 26-year-old, thinks so perfectly temple. And it made me think about all the young patients I've known in my lifetime who didn't seem to think like everyone else. They were considered super geeky or very nerdy. And I think that you, you are, you are helping us understand in the world that that line between geek and nerd and, and autism is pretty gray. And that if we just kind of got beyond the labels, there is so much potential in the different ways people think. Start us off by talking about this concept. Well, a brain can either be more cognitive or thinking or more social, emotional. And um, 
So half the population is probably going to lean a little bit towards the geeky side. But you see, it's a true continuous trait when the slightly nerdy become autism. One of the problems with autism diagnosis is it ranges from Einstein, who had no speech until age three, to somebody maybe with epilepsy and uh, cannot dress themselves. And it all has the same name. But one of my big concerns today is I'm seeing too many smart minds getting screened out and things like algebra requirements. As a visual thinker, I'm an object visualizer. I can't do abstract math. And I worked with all kinds of people who invented mechanical equipment that also could not do abstract math. And we're screening these people out. And we need these people to build food processing equipment, repair elevators and airplanes, keep the water systems running. And I tell big corporations, you need these minds. You mm -hmm. need the unique minds and you need their skills. So um, let's, let's start at the 100,000 foot look in our conversation today and kind of drill down deeper. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many questions I have and we'll get to as many of them as I can. But at the highest level of thinking about this, it turns out in education, we're favoring one way of thinking, right? And, and we're just not, we're not nurturing the others. So tell us what we're favoring, because you have an amazing story of, of you not realizing that everyone didn't think like you did, right? You have this great Halloween costume analogy. Well, when I was in my twenties, I'm doing my very first work with cattle. I, I didn't know that other people thought verbally. So it was obvious to me that if I want to find out why cattle were not going through the shoots to get vaccinated, get in the shoot and see what the cattle were seeing. And today, I think education has been really taken over by the verbal thinkers. The research in, uh, <coughs> has shown, and there's an entire chapter in my book on visual thinking, on different kinds of thinking. I'm an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture, of like a photograph. Then you have your visual spatial mathematician who thinks in patterns and then you have verbal thinkers who think in words and you get people that are mixtures of different kinds of thinking and i'm an extreme object visualizer also a lot of people i worked with on building equipment were object visualizers none of them could do algebra but several of them owned big shops and had patents on uh, 20 different pieces of equipment that they were selling around the world this is something that educators just don't get because I'm concerned that draconian algebra requirements are gonna screen out the object visualizers. These are gonna be the people that we're gonna to need to fix things, invent mechanical devices. There's two parts of engineering. There's the more mathematical part, like figure out the structural load of a roof. Um, but then there's people that invent clever equipment. That's a different kind of thinking. And the thing is, we need all the different kinds of minds and they can have complementary skills. For example, when I wrote uh, visual thinking, I, I worked with Betsy Lerner, my co-author, who's a very, very much verbal thinker. And so I'd write the rough drafts and they were kind of uh, disorganized and she would um, smooth them all out and make them really good. So that's the two different kinds of minds working together with complementary skills. Yeah, I mean, we're we're talking. Um, one of the things that I I was thinking about was that you know there you you like to say that Steve Jobs was probably mildly autistic on the spectrum, but but we're talking about um, skills that like half the folks in Silicon Valley probably have, right? Like oh, who knows so if they could have passed first that uh, freshman year algebra, right? Well, the Silicon Valley, the more mathematical types would not have failed algebra. Because there's that there's okay. the mathematical All right. side, and they're going to go into computer programming. Let's take Steve Jobs for example. He was not a programmer; he was an artist, and he made an interface for the iPhone that was really simple to use. And then the mathematically oriented computer people had to make that phone work. You see, when the mathematically oriented engineers design stuff, they make it too complicated. Steve Jobs made the phone simple. So you didn't have to have a training course on how to use this phone. Right, right. And you're talking also that this this is the mind, um, the, the skills in the minds of people like plumbers and electricians and mechanics, builders, architects, um, artists. These are folks that we imagine a world without all that. 
Well, we need the, uh, I'm very concerned in certain states, I'd probably have a very hard time graduating from high school now due to the algebra requirements. Mm -hmm. And the people I worked with have a hard time. So I've often thought if someone waved a magic wand and instead of being 75 and sitting in my house right now on Zoom, I was now 18 out of a low income uh, situation. I just failed algebra. What would I do? But let's say I still had my knowledge. Or I'd head right for that new electronic chip factory. Or I'd head right straight for the Amazon warehouse because I you know, you know what I want to do? I'm going to design the next one. And I have seen people do this. In fact, just recently, just a few months ago, um, I heard about a man who uh, got a job at a fiberglass tank factory, and six months later, he fixed every machine in that factory. That's an example of going in the back door uh, instead of going in the front door. And I think we all know folks like that. You know, um, before we move on from this, what's happening to schools and education, I remember all the way through my 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 dental life in, in, in practice talking to seventh and eighth graders there seemed to be this weird cutoff point so if you didn't if you weren't good at the algebra that they offered you as an eighth grader then you never got into algebra two in high school which also then allow you uh, allowed you to um advance to calculus trigonometry and advanced geometry right like that was like a path and then you went to college. But if you didn't have those skills in eighth grade, if you weren't good at algebra, you couldn't access that whole path in high school, which left you somewhere else when it came to going to college. Is that what you're talking about? Well, most of the people that I worked with that build equipment didn't go to college. Some of them barely graduated from high school. But I know two of them that uh, have 20 patents each and they're selling equipment all around the world. And they just uh, took, a, they took a welding class. They were a poor student, took a welding class, started making stuff, selling it at little trade shows, and then gradually grew it into a, a big business. And the thing I have found on working on big projects and being out on these big construction sites with companies like Cargill and Tyson and other companies is that there's a whole lot of people that work in a shop that are out there inventing equipment or another person with the title of drafting technician who's laying out entire factories, who maybe had a single one semester class in computer drafting, and they're laying out entire factories. And how did he get this job? He showed off one of his homework assignments to the right person, and he was hired. I worked with this person. That's examples of back doors. And we need these people. Because mm -hmm. one of the things I'm seeing right now on construction drawings is uh, leaving all the detail out. Mm. Like I had a set of plans sent to me about three years ago where they were steel and concrete work and they didn't draw the reinforcement rods in. They said, well, that's in the written spec. Well, I took a pencil and drew in the reinforcement rods and I said, take that back to that fancy engineering firm and have them draw the rods in there correctly. This is ridiculous. All right. This has huge implications in in, in our everyday lives. Like you tell some amazing stories in the book about um, where the pendulum has swung too far and we don't have these, these visual thinkers. Um, we don't have their eyeballs on the job when they're designing bridges or buildings or give us some examples, some stories that this really starts to show up. Well, there's a chapter in visual thinking on disasters. And one of the disasters I write about is Fukushima. And I was shocked when I found out why it um, melted down. The mathematically oriented engineers done a great job making earthquake proof. Shooken it, shooken it, shooken. Everything was just fine. But then 20 minutes later, the tsunami drowned the electric emergency cooling pump. And I'm going, you didn't have watertight doors? And what I've learned is the mathematicians calculate risk. Visual thinkers can see risk. And all I need to know about a nuclear reactor, if that pump doesn't run when I need it, I'm in a lots and lots and lots of trouble. And it has an electric motor and it's not gonna work underwater. Yes, so so I remember thinking this, I read that in the news, they put the pumps that actually cool the um, the core, they put the pumps that, co that cool all that water below the level where flooding would, would affect them. And they were the first thing taken out, by the way. Simple watertight doors would have saved it. 
simple old fashioned technology that was developed for the ship for the ship industry years and years and years ago. So let's let's start a little bit um, more in helping people understand where you come from, because this ability to see the detail, to really like see it in, in rich perspective and notice it is is what you were good at in the in the cattle industry. Talk to us a little bit about that life and then it I think it will help well, people it, understand. Uh, it's almost sort of like you know how on your phone you have those pictures where they're like little mini videos that move slightly. Things yes. that attract my attention, I snap a picture of it. Okay. And and it isn't like I can look at a big factory and memorize everything instantly. When I first went into a large beef plant, I remember looking at it and going, this place is so complicated. How does the plant manager understand the entire place? You know what I've learned now? Half the time, they don't understand the entire place. They just wing it. But I remember going into this beef plant, and one of the first things that attracted my attention was a little cart with a hoop for moving a 55-gallon barrel. Boom. I took a picture of that. That attracted my attention. And then as I went over there, kept going over there and watching, and it's taking more and more and more pictures. And then the whole plant comes together, and I can turn on the video recorder at one end inside my head and walk through the plant. But that doesn't happen instantly. And I tend to notice little details. Like the other day, I was at the airport, and there was like four pigeons on top of a jet bridge. You see, it's associated. And then on the last flight I was on, um, we um, got ready to... Um, take off and then we just are sitting there and I go why are we sitting there and then I see an airport operations pickup come out to pick up a single glove that was on the on the tarmac don't want that in the engine hey Dr. Linda here did you know that a recent Harvard study found that exposure to just four minutes of good news each day will make you 32 percent less anxious and 18% more optimistic? Just four minutes, we've all got that much time to devote to our worldview and our sense of flourishing. Yes, if you make a habit of learning about just one piece of remarkably good news each day, you can be the one in your circles with fresh insights, ideas, and a sense of strength. Okay, so that takes care of the problem in our personal lives. But what about our work environments? We need to feel like we come alive there, that we, that we have meaning and purpose there. Well, enter the goodness exchange for business. For companies that want to create optimistic and values-driven work cultures, our content can give you a way to turn aspirational ideas like positivity into a concrete way of being in the workplace. In fact, employee retention and attraction may depend on your company's ability to nurture a tone of innovation, interesting collaborations, and possibility. And most importantly, the Goodness Exchange can meaningfully elevate your company's wellness efforts and benefits packages because your work culture can be offering employees something new, peace of mind, and that sense of flourishing I mentioned before where employees' well-being isn't just a perk. It's the way we care about the individuals in our workplaces. So if you'd like to chat about infusing your culture with a tone of celebration about goodness and progress, we'd love to chat. Contact our CEO, Liesl. Her email address is info at goodnessexchange.com. Thanks. So your PhD was, uh, you got your PhD at the University of Illinois in what? What was your actual PhD in, Temple? It's an, it's an animal science. And one uh -huh. of the things I looked at was, you know, does providing pigs with environmental enrichment, things to chew up and things to manipulate uh, affect their brain development? And it turned out that it did. And that pigs prefer soft objects that they rip up and destruct. And that result now has been replicated a whole bunch of times. Um, but the very first research I did, I looked at what cattle were seeing, and people thought that was weird. Mm -hmm. You see, if you think verbally, you wouldn't think about what cattle are seeing. I said, now, if I right. get rid of the distractions they don't like, chains hanging down, coats on fences, reflections of, off of water, 
then they'll keep moving through the shoot. And they did when I removed those distractions. Yeah, that was your early work was, um, was uh, let's see, like simplifying and, um, and streamlining the way animals were moved through the, nav had to navigate their, their human settings, human creating settings, but usually with a lot of fear because of distractions like, well, the other that thing that makes fear in cattle is people yelling at them, people right. hitting them, poking them with electric prods. And one of the things I've worked on, you know, to get people to stop doing that, cattle handling is much better today than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did some of the most work on was developing a very simple assessment system for improving slaughter plants. And you have to figure out what are the really important things to measure. And uh, one of the things I found was um, mooing and, and vocalization. If you've got cattle mooing their heads off and you're handling them, you're doing something bad to them you shouldn't be doing to them. Right. right. And that tends to affect all kinds of things through the, the processes that we put animals through that can, you know, determine the outcomes for well, health and safety. It, right? It's definitely an animal welfare issue, but also if you... Yeah both cattle with electric prods five minutes before slaughter, you're going to get tougher meat. And in pigs, you're going to get pale, soft, watery meat. You know, so mm -hmm. good handling is going to pay. But one of my big concerns today is the educational system is kind of run by the word thinkers. Mm -hmm. And what they do to the math kids that's not good is force them to go step by step showing all the steps of the math problem. And kids that are really smart in math don't think that way. They just see the answer. And, and so in the book, I described three kinds of thinking. And there's scientific evidence for this. There's object visualizers like me who think in pictures, terrible at algebra, but good at mechanical devices, animals, art, and photography. I have talked to many, many photographers that were dyslexic. They were a student with problems in school. Then you've got your visual spatial pattern thinkers, your mathematicians. They think in patterns, not pictures. Music and math go together. And then of course, you've got your verbal thinkers who think in words, and you've got people that are mixtures of the different kinds of thinkers. But I'm very concerned that the object visualizers or people like me are gonna get screened out and you need us keep water systems running. Um, well, I also discussed that. Um, um, how do you protect these systems against hackers? I can tell you how to protect them. They will be hacked. And one of the things you can do, let's say, for example, to make sure that a big water pump doesn't run dry because that will wreck it. You put in an old fashioned flow meter, electromechanical, and if that pump runs dry, it's shut down. It is electrical, not electronic. It's hacker proof because there's nothing electronic in it. And that will protect that expensive, difficult to replace equipment from hacking. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, that's a big part of your book. I think is that, you know, visual thinking, um, it, it, it simplifies things. That's right. It, that's right. Because I just see it and I've got to protect, uh, the expensive, difficult to replace equipment. Yeah in things like power grids and in water systems and many other kinds of really vital things. I'm very Give concerned today that we don't have people to fix elevators. The last year, I have been on so many elevators that had stuff wrong with them. I was on one just the other night that was scraping and everything going up the shaft, doors not working right. I was in a fancy hotel just six months ago where the elevator skipped the floor and the bellman goes, oh, we get that floor on the way down. <laughs> no, they're not. We don't have people to fix them. And those people are getting older and older because the students that be good at that are probably the kids who flunked algebra. Well, that's one of the things you say. Let's see. Um, you say there are three reasons why we're losing this essential technical skills. Group three, of folks. Well, three reasons are... Uh, taking shop classes and hands-on classes out of the schools. Worst thing we ever did. Another thing is many corporations shut down in-house engineering departments. That was another problem. And that's why a lot of specialized equipment 
including a state-of-the-art electronic chip making machines coming from Holland and uh, food processing equipment coming from Holland. Another factor is the educational system. And in countries such as Holland, Denmark, Germany, Europe, you can choose when you're in ninth grade to go tech route or to go university route. And they don't look at the tech route as something lesser. So there's three things that affected this, taking out the hands-on shop classes out of the schools, big corporations taking in-house engineering out, and the way our educational system is structured that everybody's gonna go to college. And, the, and sort of the stigma put on to folks that don't have any intention of going to college. That's well, such a shame. I can tell you, I, when people say the stupid kids took shop, that's really wrong because it's a different kind of intelligence. I spent 25 years out on these big construction projects supervising the installation of equipment I had designed. And it's a different kind of intelligence. And so, oftentimes you had that drafting technician who was laying out entire factories. You, both, uh, both myself and the drafting technician did lots of engineering. We were very careful not to use the title. I always signed off livestock handling consultant and the drafting technician would put down drafting. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about um, th what we're really talking about all around so far in this conversation is this, I think is a rather new term, neurodiversity. Maybe people have heard that we're talking about diversity in lots of other ways in our society, but neurodiversity is coming up more and more well, often. We're going to need, about that. We're gonna need neurodiverse thinking. Now, I uh, found out that you're a dentist, and uh, I don't know why you have to have algebra for dentistry. That's beyond me. I have talked to too many students who want to be a veterinary nurse, and they're failing their second and third algebra class. A veterinarian doesn't need to take calculus. Yes, there are some fields, yes, you do need to take that math. Chemistry, physics, quantum mechanics. Yeah, there's stuff where you have to take that higher math. Orbital mechanics, uh, some av aviation stuff, stuff where you have to um, take, uh, uh, take algebra and abstract math. But there's other fields where you absolutely don't need it. And you might be screening out your best dentist. How do we, how do you think we got here? Like, um, what, what's ha what happened in society when we started going in this direction where we only rewarded this singular way of thinking? Well, I don't think they realized that they were screening out visual thinkers. Uh, okay. When I was doing the book tour for visual thinking, it was last uh, October, um, I gave a talk at a school and I spent an hour with the principal and he didn't know that visual thinking existed. And he kept asking me about how I think. And then I talked to a dean at a veterinary school, not ours, but another veterinary school somewhere else, why algebra was required. And he said, it's a, they need it to think logically. Well, let's say you're trying to fix a broken leg in a dog. I don't think that requires algebra. You would just see a good visual thinker would just see how to fix it. Yeah. So tell me, um, you've got some great examples in the book. Talk to me about what's going on with this. We don't make it here anymore. This is another thing that that we really need to pay attention to that you've observed over your 50 years. This well, we don't make it here concept. I went to four places in 2019, right before COVID shut everything down. And this is when I realized there was a lot of stuff we were not making. Uh, most of my work's been with beef and we actually still know how to build a beef plant. but I went to two state-of-the-art pork processing plants and all the equipment came from Holland. And then I went to a brand new chicken processing plant and all the equipment came from Holland in a hundred shipping containers. I said, we've got a problem here. And then I went to the Steve Jobs Theater. Structural glass walls with wiring hidden in the seams, carbon fiber roof. The structural glass walls are from Italy and Germany and the roof is from Dubai. And I stood in the middle of that screaming, we don't make it anymore. And that was, a, that was the thing that motivated me to do the book. And then COVID shut things down. And the book was our big COVID project. Betsy and I worked on this book. So you've got a chapter in here. Um called uh where are all the clever clever engineers i can tell you where some of them are i'll tell you where the clever engineers are 
They grew up without shop class. I'm seeing too many kids today that are good at Legos. They've never been introduced to tools. Get an autism diagnosis. I talked to a special ed teacher just recently. She said, well, special ed kids aren't allowed to take shop. That's totally ridiculous because I'm going to estimate that 20% of the people I've worked with, people that owned metal fabrication shops, were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I've worked with those people. They're all retiring out now. And they're wow. not getting replaced. And that kid that should be re replacing them is playing video games in the basement. I'll tell you one way to get them off the video games. Car mechanics. It's been one of the few things that's worked. And they find out motors are more interesting than video games. I mean, you you know your stuff in this category. You were when you were when you were young, you yourself didn't speak to your three and a half years old, right? Well, no, I didn't. But you know, I didn't speak until uh, three and four years old, and I had very good therapy. I got into early intervention by age two and a half, and I loved art and I loved to make things when I was a child, and that was always encouraged. In fact, I have a little book called Calling All Minds, and it's my childhood book. projects. I would spend hours tinkering with a little bird kite to get it to work. Kids don't do that anymore. I've made parachutes out of old scarves, and I've tinkered with crossbars made out of coat hangers to make them open up more easily. I spent hours doing that. And did the and parents were... come over and make it work? No, I had to figure it out for myself. And, and back and back when you were a kid, you know, you were probably teased mercilessly because we didn't think we thought that anybody who wasn't like us was worthy of teasing. No, actually, I didn't get bullied in elementary school. I went to a small elementary school where the head teacher explained to the other children that had a disability that was not visible like a wheelchair and that they yeah. should not be bullying me. High school is horrible, absolutely horrible, because as a young, a young kid. We had friends with other kids. We like to make stuff. But when you get into high school, girls aren't interested in that kind of stuff anymore. And I still was interested in that kind of stuff. Mother worked really hard to develop my skills in art. That was really important. Yeah. And I spent lots of time making stuff. Now, um, I love that. I love this distinction you make in the book. You say this great thing that object thinkers build the trains and spatial thinkers run them. Talk to us about that. Well, they, the object visualizers um, are the ones that figure out all the mechanical stuff on a train. But then there's other mathematical stuff in engineering that you'd have to do two on a train. They will calculate how it's supposed to work. Object visualizers will make it work. And there's things I can't do well. I don't have any working memory, for example. It's like I take these series of snapshots you know, mm -hmm. see the whole of something. Um, and so things that are sequential, I can't, I have a hard time remembering sequence unless I write it down. Now, if I write it down like a pilot's checklist, then I have no problem. What part of your work do you think parents or grandparents um, need to know these days if they're working with a child? I find, well, my daughter was so unusual and she was bullied horribly in seventh and eighth grade that by high school, my husband and I said, she will not be served in a regular high school curriculum. And by golly, <laughs> we coached her a little bit. And she walked right into the principal, principal's office and said, I want to go to school in a whole different way. I want to follow my artistic things. She was a natural engineer. She said, I want to be able to use all my classes to follow my engineering passions. And um, he listened to her patiently. And he said, okay, you figure out how to, how to make, create a pathway for thinkers like you and we'll, we'll support you. And so, so she did. Um, and it was a great, ex she had a great high school experience only because she was allowed to use this unusual way her brain was put together. Well, so, I do a lot but, of, I, I do a lot of talks to big corporations and they ask, well, what's the first thing we need to know? So the first thing you need to realize is that people think differently and they have complementary skills. I talked about Steve Jobs. He was an artist. He made the iPhone interface was easy to use. The mathematicians had to make the phone work. That's an example of complementary skills. So the first step okay. is realizing that these different kinds of thinking exist. And what worries me today is the object visualizers like me getting screened out, labeled the disabled, and because we can't do certain things. Now, where I do have a problem is if someone just yaks me very, very fast, 
a sequence. I can't remember. There was a sad mm -hmm. story where an autistic man got fired from two electrician apprenticeships because the boss went yak, yak, ceiling light, light switch, dimmer switch, and he didn't put the stuff in right. You see, if he had just spent two minutes writing down a checklist of things he was going to install that day and the order of the installing them, it wouldn't have happened. That's a very, very easy accommodation. So what kind of what kind of advice should we be giving parents in exactly that that situation? Like um, you have several books. You have you have a wonder you have a couple books that are great for parents, right? Yeah, I have the way I see it. That's a really good book for for parents and then navigating autism that I did with Deborah Moore. Because one of the big problems is parents get locked into the label. And when they get locked into the label, they don't think their kid can do anything. And one of the biggest problems I'm seeing right now, fully verbal kids, is they're not learning basic skills, money, shopping. I'm appalled at the number of teenagers that are fully verbal who've never gone into a store by themselves and bought something. I, I was shopping when I was eight years old. The other thing yeah. that's a problem is social skills are not taught in the same structured way they were taught in the 50s. And this is one of the reasons why I have grandparents coming up to me all the time and they discover they're autistic when the grandkids get diagnosed. And that grandfather managed to keep a good job, get a good job and keep a good job because they were taught social skills. That's very interesting. I think in our in our haste to to maybe embrace the diversity in everybody, we're forgetting that there's like certain basics that make you able to function in society or not. Well, there was a scene in the HBO movie where the boss slammed down in the old jail room and said, you stink, use it. That actually happened. Yeah, that hygiene, <laughs> you got to clean it up. It's just that simple. You got to clean it up. You can be yeah, eccentric, so you can be eccentric, but you can't be a rude, filthy, dirty slob. <laughs> now, you have this great point where you say, focus on animals. When we focus on uh, an animals precisely because they are nonverbal, what can they teach us about ways that we can that way the ways we think like talk to us about this well an animal is an animal's a sensory based thinker they don't think in words they're okay. going to think in pictures uh, in one of my books animals in translation i did i talk about the black hat horse and this horse had been abused by a person wearing a black cowboy hat so black cowboy hats were bad and white cowboy hats were good you see that's a visual fear memory or Another animal might be afraid of a certain sound that's associated with something bad, or the sound of a certain truck is associated with getting their food brought to them. You see, that is <clears throat> sensory-based thinking. I'm now seeing a picture at our experiment station, the truck out in the pasture and all the cows are running towards it because they know they're going to get fed. <laughs> and of course, we, we behave in that way sometimes too with with cues in our environment, what we hear or smell or, or see. But it, but an animal is totally a sensory ba based thinker. And then you have people right. that are highly verbal where all the, their thoughts are in words mixed with emotion. And they have very little um, uh, visual or auditory thinker, auditory thinking. Give us some, give us some more stories that you have about um, about why this is important? Well, I, my student, um, Megan Corrigan, just did a study that showed why horses sometimes might spook and there doesn't seem to be a reason for it. And she took a children's play set. You know, this about four foot by four foot square with a colorful slide and a swing. She walked young fillies and colts by this uh, 15, 16 times until they no longer stopped, no longer reacted. And when that um, play set was rotated, it became a new object. Think about it. If this is the slide, that looks different than that. Yes. And uh, I kind of repeated that experiment with a big green chair with Western riders just walking. And uh, when the chair was rotated, half the horses did a hard stop. And we did it at a walk so it would be safe. I just wanted to prove the point. You know, that's an example of a visual memory that object sort of became something else when it got rotated. Right, right. 
and we could have children that are behaving that that um, maybe are nonverbal on the spectrum that behave the same way. Well, some that was nonverbal, one of the biggest frustrations is not being able to communicate. I can remember that frustration when I was like three and a half years old and I couldn't okay. talk. So I throw a tantrum. The other pro problem with a nonverbal individual, they can have a painful medical problem that they cannot tell you about, you know, mm -hmm. such as acid reflux, for example. And they're not able to tell you about that. Um, yeah. Or they have an ear infection or a urinary tract infection or um, some other thing, toothache, something they can't tell you about. And then when you get the hidden painful medical problem fixed, then they're a lot better. And doctors have a tendency to say, well, the behavior is just autism. And the individual really did have acid reflux. And when it was treated, the behavior got better. Right. <laughs> oh, there's all that mixing I hadn't really thought of before too, because you can disregard things um, well, pretty easy. Well, there's a tendency to say, well, that's just autistic behavior. Right. But the person had a medical issue that was causing pain that they were not able to tell anybody about. So Temple, there's this great little, in the afterword of your book, you say, I'm, I'm so convinced um, that two key elements set the stage for success in fostering these abilities in kids. Um, and you, you talk about exposure and mentorship. Yes. Talk to us about yes exposure and mentorship because these are key they are absolutely now. key because how did i get in the cattle industry i was raised back east i got exposed to cattle when i was a teenager right. i was not exposed to them when i was a child and another example i use is michael and angelo a grubby little 12 year old running around all the churches seeing great art grew up with stone cutting tools started to make some stuff that's exposure then he was taken into a studio and apprenticed and mentored. But you look all kinds of careers. You have to get exposed. You might say, well, I, I shadowed a doctor and I didn't like that. Or I shadowed a doctor and I go, oh, that's exactly what I'd want to do. I tell students, try on careers. Make sure it is what you think it's going to be. Grab opportunities to do internships. Help out research projects. So you get exposed to just lots of different things. I just recently gave a talk at a high school, the Future Farmers of America class. And I emphasize, try different stuff. See what you like, but you also need to find out what you hate too. Yeah. And where does mentorship, because that's 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 so huge too. We've got to have I some patience. A, we can I had a great uh, science teacher, Mr. Carlock, and I was goofing off in school. You know, English and history, that was goofing off. And I just wasn't interested in, in studying. And he um, uh, gave me interesting projects and showed me how education was a pathway to becoming a scientist. Yes. And um, on my math problems, I had to drop a physics class. I had to drop a biomedical engineering class. And fortunately, algebra was not the freshman math class in 1967. It was statistics, matrices, and... Uh, things that were more visual that I could see. And they called it finite math. A lot of probability, statistics, probability, and matrices. What do you think, um, how do you think we get back, you know, um, I'm a welder, by the way. <laughs> I had to, and you know, talking about exposure, I learned to weld on the farm. I grew up okay. on a farm in Illinois as we spoke and things were constantly broken. You can hire somebody to come in and fix them. My dad kept a acetylene tank and an oxygen tank in the corner of the barn. Sometimes it got run over by the tractor and um, we just had to fix things. So That's I right. weld, I do art. I do art with my welding now all my adult life because I don't have a farm, but talk to us about how, you know, how do we, how do we get these skills back, um, back as valuable? Well, and there are some school systems starting to put it back in. I was just down at Nebraska at Meta High School, and uh, they had a wonderful shop program and a wonderful art program. And, uh, you know, Texas, Minnesota, some of these where there's a lot of industry of putting it back in. But then I get into other states where all of it's been taken out. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And I was appalled oh, yes. at the principal who didn't know what visual thinking was when I was out on the book tour. 
Is this something we have to demand? Is it, um, you know, <laughs> Temple, is it going to come down to like, I think I last hired a plumber and it was about $180 an hour. And um, is it, do we just have to wait till they're in such short demand that they cost $200 an hour before people start respecting these trades as something that's integral to society? Well, I've noticed, um, I've been keep, kind of keeping track of, of uh, how age of uh, elevator repair people, escalator repair, but airplane mechanics, the last two airplane mechanics on my flights, they were gray. Yes. And the elevator, a lot of the elevator people are getting older. Yeah. And they will, they retire out. We're going to be in, in problems. We've got to have people that fix things. And one of the reasons I'll save money, but what's happened in some school districts, you can get in high school, you can do English, algebra, and sports. And sports is a good thing, but I've seen things where they'd spend $100,000 on a new tract and then cancel band. And there's a lot more jobs in music than there is in track getting really an overemphasis on sports because most students are not going to make a career out of sports. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of this is very, very much common sense in the book. Um, I, I just have to, again, tell people that I, I, I've i literally thought of at least a hundred different people when I read this book in my life. There was a wonderful young man in my grade school years, all through my grade school named Roger Schmidt. He was the most amazing thinker. He was one of those kids in, in the third grade who knew every dinosaur's name. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he, he could look up at the sky when an airplane went over and he could tell you exactly what kind of airplane that was. And, yeah. you know, sadly, um, he had committed suicide by the time he was 21. Um, the, we weren't validating these impulses in children, especially boys, even back 45 years ago, were we? Well, you take, when I was a child, I had a book about famous inventors, you know, and, and uh, I really liked that. I really liked that book. And when you look at the original old patents, they're all mechanical devices, the sewing machine, the grain harvesting machine. These were mechanical devices. In fact, the patent office originally required you to give them a model of a, the device of the invention in the very oh. beginning. And that mechanical mindset, that figuring out of how one thing connects to the other, is that what you're talking about in this section about the genetics of genius? Yeah, that's one of the things I'm talking about. And I have parents say to me, well, my kid takes stuff apart, doesn't put it back together again. I said, you need to teach them to lay the parts out in a line as they take it apart. Then they can put it back together in the same order. Yeah, that we gotta, is, we gotta that, encourage the putting them back together. But then I have heard of autistic kids that were capable of fixing stuff and they were never given the opportunity to do it. I'm seeing too many kids doing fantastic stuff with Legos as a teenager, and tools were never introduced. Right. I'm, a, I'm a believer in introducing kids to all kinds of things: computer programming, music, math, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Kind of see what they gravitate towards. They're going to be you others know, that are definitely going to be verbal thinkers. And that, and that Lego connection is, is very, very important. I mean, it, it, for the last 30 years, you know, Lego is engaging young people's minds who I think are on in this, in this, uh, this visual thinking mindset, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. 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 But then there's a point where tools need to be introduced. I was using tools in second grade, hammer, uh, screwdriver, and pliers. So I can remember my little kid's hands weren't strong enough to cut the coat hanger. So I'd make a dent in it and then I'd bend it back and forth to, to cut it. But you know, you grew up on a farm getting exposed to all this stuff. We got kids today where um, they don't get exposed to any hands-on stuff. I think it's also terrible they took out all the cooking, the sewing, the home ec stuff. Um, all uh, theater, all kinds of things. Mm. They're all things that can turn into careers. I remember on the farm, um, we we the hay bales used to be together with baling wire, yeah. and we were never allowed to throw throw away or discard the baling wire because that could be used for so many other things. That's clever right. engineering. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Things that you could put together with baling wire. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, okay. So as we go forward, I really, um, I'm going to really encourage people um, from after reading this book to sort of avoid the disability trap. You talk That's about right. the disability trap. Let's let's not embrace these labels that society wants to give our kids that imply disability when it's really just a different way of thinking. Is that well, especially the way uh, with autism in the milder, milder versions of it is <laughs> a different way of thinking. And I'm, as I said before, I'm going to estimate that 20% of the skilled shop people and skilled drafting designer people I worked with were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I've done work for every major meat company. They're, they're all the same on this. And these people are retiring out and they're not getting replaced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they can't do algebra. None of them could. The ones that were the extreme object visualizers. And that seems to be our current litmus test for what direction you go next. Well, as I said, I, I half of all good jobs are back door. And I talked mm -hmm. to a young man that's uh, late twenties. Uh, he got a job just doing labor in a marble factory that makes countertops. Mm -hmm. Then he learned how to use the saws. And then he said to his boss, can I have all little marble scraps you're throwing in a dumpster? And he made beautiful marble chess tables out of it. Then he learned how to fix the programmable logic controllers on these machines. He is now fixing high-tech marble cutting equipment all over the U.S. This mm -hmm. was total backdoor. And this is now. This is what I told you about the fiberglass tank guy and the marble guy. Uh, they are now within the last year. Mm -hmm. People that went in the back door and went into very successful careers. I'm thinking most of us, I, I know I have a heck of a lot of patients who are in that, that category. You can just tell that, uh, you know, they found their niche as others found how wise they were in some ways of thinking that can help the businesses. So the, this in avoiding the disability trap though, um, has a, has a bit of a drawback that I've been noticing. Talk to us temple about this. Like you can't get services. That's the problem. You see, you see, the problem is if you don't have the label, you can't get any services. That's yeah. the problem. If you don't have the label, you don't get services. But I'm saying, you know, as Deborah Moore talks about navigating autism, label locking. And what's mm -hmm. happening is parents are not seeing their kid. They're just seeing the label. And I'm seeing too many parents uh, too overprotective and they are not learning any life skills. Another mm -hmm. problem I see is they have all this emphasis on academics, but the kid doesn't know how to budget or buy groceries or even go buy a candy bar in a store. Right, right. Okay, so if a parent's facing, because okay, because I have heard a lot of this needing the school to adapt the learning environment to, to meet the kid's needs, but you're unable to get the school to do that kind of adaptation. Right, let's, let's, just talk about some of, let's just talk about some of the adaptations. And we talk about this in a very abstract way. And I find yeah. we've got to have accommodations. Well, one of the things for some people who are dyslexic and have autism, they can see flicker on fluorescent, on fluorescent lights and on LED lights. And we need to um, use the LEDs that don't flicker. And the way really? you can find that is to photograph the classroom with a slow motion video then play it back in slow motion. That can be a problem. The other problem is I cannot remember long strings of verbal instruction. I have got to write it down. Also, on my first job, don't put me on the chaotic takeout window. There's too much fast multitasking. That's not going to work very well. You see, like the people I worked with that work in a shop, you see, there's no multitasking. They're working on one project at a time and they see it in their heads. There's, there's no sequencing. When you make your art with your welder, you probably don't sequence. You just see it and do it. That's exactly right. Yes, I see it and do this it. This is yeah. something that, that um, you know, I've heard two sad stories where two jobs were lost, where they were given yak, yak, yak verbal directions and they weren't able to write it down. Right. But there's other things that the object visualizer can do super well. Yeah. And, you know, isn't that the bottom line? Is everybody finding the right seat on the bus? Well, that's right. And, and 
I also want to tell business people that we need the different kinds of minds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got to keep important stuff going, like waterworks, power grid, things like this. Yeah. Um, yesterday, uh, yesterday, my husband, my husband d does woodworking, but he's very, he's very methodical about how he does it. And me with my welding, I'm just very out there crazy. Okay. And so yesterday we made a piece of art together and he started, we started out with him finding the wood rhythm. And then he and I went into the welding shop and then we kept creating and creating. And I found that this, this, this point about collaboration temple that you talk about, the collaborative partnerships between the different ways people well, think. Well, you see, the first step is to realize that different minds can bring complementary skills. Let's go back to the food processing right. plants. Right. The degree engineer would do the boilers, the refrigeration. The people I worked with in the shop, they never touched that stuff. They didn't understand it. That required right. too much math. Make sure the building doesn't fall down. The degree engineers would do that. But the degree engineers were not inventing mechanical devices in the shop and the other thing i found is the shop people often didn't get enough credit for their work either mm -hmm. they were out there inventing and patenting all kinds of equipment yes yeah i don't think enough of us understand manufacturing if we're not in that world to appreciate the shop floor like in this big oven company that my my daughter i told you she was an engineer yeah. at there is the shop floor and she absolutely loves it down there she the, the the guys on the floor and mostly men call her the girl <laughs> and and she goes down there with her engineering thought process she she can't even begin to start to to mastermind something without asking them what they think well exactly no that's something i always did too what i have found is if you have something that's an absolutely totally radical new idea they'll have a tendency to say it doesn't work but boy if it's something that's an incremental improvement Oh, they will really show you how it how to make yes. it work. Yeah, yeah. Sure Absolutely show you. Like when people great. talk about stuff, they're too vague. Let's take things like when the power plant side got frozen down in Texas. They talked all this vague stuff, but nobody said what piece of equipment froze in each plant. And then you'd be able to determine how expensive they might be to winterize. But you can't mm -hmm. determine that until you know what piece of equipment froze in each plant. That ne I never got discussed in the press. Interesting. It's Interesting. Not, they're not specific enough. Um, teachers will say, well, how do I work with autistic kids? Well, they're asking a question that's way too broad. Let's start with the age. It was a little kid, early intervention, or uh, a fully verbal high school students get bullied. I'm going to need to get more information. The verbal thinker tends to overgeneralize broad concepts and overgeneralize and maybe okay. the visual thinker had and the math thinker have too much detail okay so that's a very very important point if you're a parent or a teacher of or a grandparent of a visual thinker that we're i'm constantly overgeneralizing and and just think you know thinking that the other person is capable of filling in the gaps but you can't you can't i mean a teacher asked me just the other day well how do i teach autistic kids i go what age I got, you know, I got a little kid early intervention and grade school and high school, fully verbal. Uh, what's their problem? I have to have more information. Now, there's a few general things I can give you. The multitasking, rapid multitasking doesn't work. And the pilot's just checklist is essential on sequential verbal information. And that goes across a lot of thinking differences. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has some connection Tell us one more story uh, that will help us understand this even deeper. You've got a great story about the Boeing, uh, Boeing 737 MAX. Oh, the Boeing 737 MAX. And by the way, they're, uh, they're, they've got it back in the air. It's got the best luggage bins in the industry. You can get okay. everybody's bag on it now. Uh, they, when I found out, when the, when the plane first crashed, I was, was with failing, Brad, yeah. and Brad is a works with me on selling books and we're both kind of aviation geeks and we like to look at crazy videos like airbus is trying to take off like fighter jets and you know crazy stuff like that and when that accident happened i only knew two facts it was a brand new airplane at that at this point i didn't even know what brand of airplane it was and when you looked at the radar on takeoff it was going up and down like a roller coaster 
And then the next night I gave a talk and I said, Boeing is going to be in deep poo-poo over this. I knew just on those two things that something was drastically wrong with this brand new airplane. Mm -hmm. And Brad's going, well, how do you know that? Well, I just kind of visualized it. It turned out there was something drastically wrong with it. And then I found out what an angle of attack sensor was. And it's a very delicate little fin that measures air angle. It tells the pilot if the plane is stalling. You know, if you take your paper glider and you throw it, we'll fly up like this and stall and then maybe get airspeed and recover from a stall. And you certainly don't want an airliner to stall. Right. And the Boeing had taken a 737 airframe and wanted to put big fuel efficient engines on it, but keep the old airframe so it's not a new airplane. Then they don't have to retrain the pilots. But those engines tended to make the plane a little more prone to stalling. So they took the single delicate angle of attack sensor that a bird can just knock off a plane and hooked it up to a computer system pilots didn't know about. And I'm going, how could you do that? Well, they don't see it. Now, since the book has been written, I sat on an airplane next to a Boeing engineer and we discussed the luggage racks. But she also told me that um, somebody in the shop had warned them about it and they were ignored. And so in the beginning, this was visual thinking mistake. It would have been very, very easy to correct. It would have been super easy to correct this mistake. How could you do this? And what happened when you broke the sensor, the plane thought it was stalling when it wasn't. And the, so the computer shoved the nose down and the pilots kept trying to pull it back up. I'm going, how could you do this? And, that's and I'm realizing saw. that they don't see it. Because right. in the beginning, it would have been very, very simple to fix it. When you break the sensor, the default setting for the computer was stall. When you break the sensor, the default setting should be fly normally and return to the airport. Wow. You see how simple that is? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like going, wow. how could you do this? And then I remember after going to the next flight, I went, I'm looking at angle of attack sensors on every plane that's like <laughs> set at the gate. And I'm going, how could you wire the plane's computer to single delicate sensor? that a pigeon could bust off a plane. It is one of those major things that now that you've explained it just like that, to me, it does defy common sense. Well, I think common sense is visual thinking. Okay, let's just okay. think of something is, is seeing risk. Okay, there's a couple of grapes on the floor at the supermarket because you, you pick them up so somebody isn't going to um, slip and fall on them. That's an example of seeing risk. Okay. Just a very, very and simple example of seeing risk instead of calculating risk. This is so great. I love that last point. Um, our, my last question is, um, Temple, what do you really wish people knew? You know, what, if, 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 if this interview had only been five minutes long, what do you really wish people knew? Do you ever just go, oh, I really wish people knew something? Well, the first step is people have to realize different minds exist. Because when I was a lot younger, we'd sit in a job trailer and talk about the suits being stupid. And it wasn't, it was wrong to say that because the suits would be verbal thinkers. And I'd, you see, if you don't see it, it makes them look stupid. The first thing we have to realize is that we need all the different kinds of minds and they need to work together in a complementary way. I'll give you an example of where you need a lawyer would be a suit. My grandfather was the co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. MIT trained engineer, mathematician, worked with an autistic person who came up with a new idea for an autopilot that was totally novel. And everybody in aviation thought it was so ridiculous. And they tinkered in a loft. They got the thing built. The stolen version was in every warplane during World War II. They needed a lawyer. That's an example of different minds should have been working together. Exactly, exactly. Well, I can't thank you enough. Temple Grandin, this book, if you, if you, you know somebody that's a little bit too geeky or you were, you know, and you just, and you just want to make sense of how life's either gone for you or going to go for your children that, um, that seem to think differently mm -hmm. than others. Also, this book, Visual Thinking. 
we need to be doing some changes in our educational system. Put all the hands-on right. classes back in, and uh, because we need all the different kinds of minds, because it's the people like me who can't do algebra are going to keep the water system running, keep the elevators running, other things that are mechanical. I tell business people, you need all the different kinds of minds. And the first step is realizing that they exist. That is lovely. Thank you so much, Temple. You know, um, we're we're going to wrap up today's interview with Temple, Dr. Temple Grandin. Um, she is an amazing force um, in the world for the last five decades in helping us really un understand and appreciate neurodiversity. I can't thank you enough. I hope that all these connections, the goodness and progress that she and I talked about today get you through your week and you um, start finding all the wonder that she has been pointing to. And um, we can all start appreciating all the different ways that we can think. Thank and you, Temple. And um, in my book, Visual Thinking, I also have the science that supports what I'm saying. Oh, I have to say, I, I can't finish without that. I got to tell you, Temple, it was one, one of my questions. You, you will not believe the length and the details of the references in this book. If you are at all a science nerd and and you want to really appreciate the the gravity of what Temple has amassed in this book, the acknowledgments have to be 50 pages. It's unbelievable. Thanks for bringing that up, Temple. No, I always cite my sources. Yes, it's just that is a wonderful part of this book. I meant to mention, I'm glad you brought it up. Okay, well, you have a great evening. I will. Thanks so much, well, Temple. Well, thank you so much.